Um, we're going to move on the public questions, if there are some. Est-ce que vous parlez réellement entre vous C'est-à-dire que vous échangez beaucoup d'informations entre vous euh, Parce que là, on parle en ce moment en France des états généraux de la bande dessinée, c'était hier matin, euh, pour justement échanger des chiffres, des données, des impressions, des choses comme ça. Est-ce que ça, ça arrive en fait entre auteurs et Image Comics, euh, par exemple Et euh, la deuxième chose, c'est pour juste bien comprendre comment ça fonctionne, parce que c'est très différent en France, euh, notamment au niveau des droits, des sessions de droits, etc. Euh, chez euh, DC et Marvel, vous, vous êtes appelé par DC et Marvel pour travailler sur une série, alors que chez Image, vous apportez vos idées, euh, mais vous apportez déjà un projet euh, avancé, euh, un projet qui est déjà construit avec un dessinateur, où euh, vous êtes complètement libre, et à ce moment-là, ils publient tout le monde. Et, euh, je ne sais pas trop comment ils vous sélectionnent, en fait, euh, pour vous publier chez Image. Euh. I think it's closer to how it's done in Europe where if I got the question right, it's it's your idea, yeah, and you're bringing it to the publisher and the publisher is just a um just a, a just, just, a, just a publisher, you know, and they take is that, is that what you're asking? Yeah, it's just, um, yeah, whereas DC and Marvel and those companies, they have their properties, they hire you as a hired hand, and we have Batman and Superman and Spider-Man, et cetera, and you, uh, uh, you come with your ideas of what you want to do with their properties, but at the end of the day, it gets passed on to somebody else's hands eventually. But um, uh, yeah, at, at Image, it's pretty much like, like Scott was saying, what, what, it's like, what do you want to do? You know, what's your idea? But how can they decide that you are going to be published in the in the brand? I yeah. So it's basically all up to Eric Stevenson, who is um, the publisher of Image, the boss. Uh, every single pitch goes by him, and he just says yes or no. So really, <laughs> there's no committee or anything. It's really pretty much just down to Eric. But it, it's different from uh, Marvel and DC to pitch a, a Spider-Man story and they'd say, we, we like your story, we're going to pair you with this artist. That's not how image works. You have to bring them a complete package. That here is the artist, here is the idea, here's our, our letterer. You, you know, they see everything. And do they want to publish it or not? To your answer to your first question, um, I, we do talk about numbers. Well, at least I do. I'll speak for myself. Uh, I from, no, Scott knows what I've made last year. I mean, I, we're not really shy or um, we're not trying to, uh, it, maybe it's personal information, but we find it easier if you just are honest with what you're making, what your page rate is at Marvel or DC. Is it worth it to go to Image? How many books do you need to sell a month before it becomes lucrative? Um, you know, how are you supplementing your, supplementing your income? You know, uh, you can, at Image, make prints of your characters and sell just your covers uh, without the, the logo on it make a whole bunch of money on the side just doing that stuff. Um, all, all that stuff is very important. And with the, our industry, there is no union, which is very very unusual, I'm told. Um, so the fact that we are all so open and honest with each, with each other helps us and probably hurts Marvel and DC. They don't want us communicating. They, they want us to go in and not know what a page rate should be. You know, And why wouldn't they? And that's capitalism. That's fine. It is what it is. Um, But I feel like with a lot of people here, because I am friends with a lot of you, you know, when you tell me what your rate is, I, I want you to be successful. I've never heard um, of, you know, when Fiona's making a killing on, on, on Saga, I am genuinely happy for your success. <laughs> and I'm like, I see you as somebody that I want information from, because I want to help myself, and I want to 
help you, and you know, I obviously don't tell everybody, but it's super helpful to be able to share that stuff. But it, I guess it only works if you trust the other creator and your your friends, because there's a lot of uh, competitive behavior out there that maybe you wouldn't want to share that stuff with. But at least for me, I'm very open and honest, and I find it useful. Hi guys, morning. Um, love your work. Um, and uh, this question is for Fiona. Uh, I really admire what you're doing and the work art of Saga. I think the characters and the, the, the scenery and everything surrounding it is great. And actually, I really like the story, of course. <laughs> it's girls' talk, you know, girls' talk. <laughs> And um, I really want to know what inspired you to do that, and what reference any authors, any anything, or just your personal world, you know, sci-fi references. Uh, well, the look of Saga is um, mostly a product of my time constraints, <laughs> because uh, I've never done a monthly series before, so the first thing I had to figure out was um, how to speed up my process in order to do almost a book a month. Um, and I've always kind of wanted to do like a, a painted comic. Uh, some of the first comics that I got into were like heavy metal, and I loved Ashley Wood's work. Um, but I found that when I tried to do a painted comic, it came out looking like kind of messy and kind of static, and it didn't have the clarity and the energy that I wanted. So for Saga, I experimented a little bit and reached a sort of compromise where I would have painted backgrounds and then you know inked characters with simple flat sort of cell shaded color on them. Um, and that way I could go nuts with the backgrounds because I knew we'd be visiting all, all sorts of different alien worlds and crazy settings. Um, so I would have a lot of flexibility in painting those, but at the same time, the look of the characters would stay consistent and hopefully um, the characters would remain easy to read. Because um, that's the, sort of the most important thing for me is that the characters and the, the foreground elements are easy and quick to read. You don't have to study them too long or think about them. Um, your eyes can just do it, take it in automatically without being bogged down in too much rendering or too much detail. Uh, so that was sort of how I came up with the, the style for this book. Um, it's pretty influenced by you know animation as well, obviously. And um, when it comes to design. Uh, I'm mostly, mostly inspired by just real life locations, you know, earthly locations, <laughs> uh, ancient history as well as, um, you know, fashion or movies, video games. Is any character that you like most your favorite character? Yeah, I like them all. But <laughs> um, I really like Marco's mom. <laughs> I just really like the way Brian writes her. She's a okay, <laughs> hilarious, okay. tough old lady. Thank you, thank you. Uh, hi, this is a question for Brian and Fiona. Um, just wanted to ask um, whether the character of the writer in Saga, um, is it, I'm having a blank, um, is it Oswald Geist? Heist, yeah. Heist. Um, is he based on Warren Ellis? It's <laughs> funny, I hear. Uh, yeah, Samuel Delaney or Alan Moore or Warren Ellis or uh, no, he's just a uh, made up Cyclops guy. But I think all writers are, we're all kind of beardy drunks. So <laughs> it is, we all kind of blend together. But uh, no, I love Warren, but uh, that, that's not what I had in mind. Hello. Um, et euh, quand on voit les chiffres euh, des traites, <rire> euh, quand, on voit, quand on voit les chiffres euh, de vos TPV euh, et les scores par rapport à ce qui est fait euh, chez Marvel ou chez DC, euh, est-ce que cela influence votre manière d'écrire vos épisodes euh, et de les de faire en sorte que ça rentre dans une Dans un, dans quatre épisodes, dans six épisodes par, par histoire. Non, 
I'd say for, for Saga, we did something relatively new, which is my experience at Marvel and DC was always you can't stop the monthly train, that a book has to come out every month, and very few living artists can draw 12 books a year, so you would always have to work with a fill-in artist, and for Saga, we just decided we, we didn't want to do that. I couldn't imagine anyone other than Fiona drawing it, so we decided we would put out six issues and then take a break. Um, Image was scared for us, and they said with them, the book might tank, that it's a real danger uh, to disappear, but um, it seemed to have worked out great. That when we stop, we give everyone a chance to catch up on the collection, and then uh, you join us. So, no, if anything, it's we're responding to what we can't do at Marvel and DC, and trying new things. And I'm kind of naive, and I had no idea that you couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, well, when we run out of time, we'll just take a break. <laughs> Um, and yeah, there was a lot of pushback at first, but now I think people pretty much accepted it. Um, but I didn't grow up reading a lot of ongoing monthly series. I read miniseries and independent books that were late all the time. Yeah. <laughs> this, is a, this is something sorry, that's also been placed, for example, for Deadly Class of Black Science. You are taking sometimes a month off to catch your breath and continue to publish with the same artist, right? Yeah, and uh, this Fiona was telling me, it's like, it's crazy because at the beginning you're so scared of the deadlines and stuff. And then something happens, you get sick or something, and you can't finish the issue on time. And something happens, basically. It just gets delayed. <laughs> so, like, it just comes out one, it just goes out one week after, two weeks after. Not, not, I mean, sometimes if you keep doing that, it starts affecting the, the sales, so it's not good for you. But at the same time, you know, nobody dies. Yeah, you can do it. So let's stop for two months. I need the vacation. Right now, I'm going to the state for one month. Woo! <laughs> so we took, like, in, instead of two months, we take in three months, and the book is going to be out after three months. Yeah, you, can, you can do it. It's all up to you. That's a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. Yeah. So it's all up to you. Yeah, as long as you kind of train as long as you train the reader, this thing working at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, 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 it's working. It's working. It, it, as long as you, that, that sounds bad, train the reader, but as long as they know that there's a break between the story arcs and you'll be back on time, and as long as you're not, it's like six months later, seven months later, and like uh, certain, certain comics are <coughs> facing it as, as a kid, if like, is that comic just done? Are they coming back at all? Or like, I don't know, there's battle chasers thing that got as a kid, it's like, that just, just going to disappear one day, and this story's never going to get finished. Like, as long as you're, you know, as long as you're not too late, I don't, I don't think it, it matters. You know. Yeah, absolutely. I think the main thing is just be honest. Like, okay, I'm not going to make it. Let's yeah. let's wait for three months every time after the, I don't know, maybe the TPP comes out. Let's just be honest with the readers. And we'll be back, but in three months we got them for it, and that's it. And it's, it basically is the best rule for everything. Like, uh, I remember, like, the first gigs that I got, I got asked, like, how much time do you need to do an issue? And at the beginning, I was trying to, you know, to be like, uh, if I needed one month and off, I was saying one month. No, it's not the right thing, because at the end, you won't be able to do that. So you you look like a, like a dishonest person, and it, it affects your your image in a bad way. So, it's not the important thing. Um. The question also of uh, the gentleman was, because now, uh, like 20 years ago, uh, comic books were sold only in single issues. I know they sold in trade paperbacks a lot. Uh, has this changed the way that you're writing the stories, like in terms of art that it can, or are you just, you keep going and then you say, well, if they collect six or eight or 10 issues, I don't care, they're just going to do this what I do. Or are you thinking in terms of like global arts that are collected in trade? I think Oh, I see. Yeah, uh, there's, no, I always hear writing for the trade or, uh, but I, I've uh, approached comics the same way at the very beginning, that you have to give people a very satisfying experience, however they're reading it. If it's just going to be 20 pages at a time, or if it's going to be collected, I, I think you just have to worry about <coughs> that each individual unit. So it, I don't think it's really it's changed the way I've written. I don't know about you guys. Oh, 
Why, uh, I'm curious, do we, why wouldn't we just do graph analysis? Why do we do serialization? Obviously, it's like a tradition, but I feel like, um, you know, Saga does in books like that do very well in trade, and I like issues too, but I, I'm having a hard time justifying it as time goes on. I feel like uh, you're seeing it all collected at Urban. It's like, man, this is really the way to digest it. This is the way people are going to remember it. They don't really remember the trade, uh, the single issues as much as just the whole book itself, you know? So I don't know, I have a hard time on um, sort of convincing myself that periodicals are still the way to go. I don't know how you guys feel about it. I really like monthly comics as a form. Um, I think they're unique, and I think as a reader, I like sort of watching the story unfold in real time, bit by bit, along with all the other readers. Um, there's this kind of sense of community with the other readers, and you talk about the issue each month, the new issue of whatever you're reading, um, and we try to enhance that experience a little bit, with doing whatever we can, um, like with our, our letter column and some of the back matter that we have in the the single issues that's not reproduced anywhere. And um, it makes it fun to interact with fans online as well, see their reactions whenever the new issue hits. So, um, right. Uh, hi, I want. I get the impression for something that you said before. Sean said that uh, the authors' careers are made in Marvel and DC, and then you get published in an independent publisher. <coughs> like maybe some nobody gets published an image in image, and then they they get nowhere. I mean, or maybe they get to pick some some noise or some attention from Marvel, and then. I mean, I know most of you guys from Marvel and DC, and then I, I get that impression that you said that, hey, I want to know what this guy can do. But uh, do you feel that Marvel and DC are still the place to make a career for new artists and writers? Yeah, I, I think it's a great place to end. I'd always heard that Marvel say, look, we're not a training ground. We're not here to teach you how to write comics. You know, you have to, and I thought that's fine for them to say that. I don't care. I'm going to use them to learn how to write comics on, on their dime and make money, and then steal all the readers and take them away. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, no, I, I love Marvel and DC. I always said they're like my divorced parents, and they raised me. And but there comes a time where I think you have to leave your parents' house. And uh, yeah, like it, it used to be the the opposite that you would you know, uh, try for years in independent comics to scrap and get a few readers to earn your way to, to get to Marvel and DC. And I, I hope this will be the opposite now, that people go do great work at Marvel and DC for a few years and, and learn a lot and meet a lot of great people and then leave to go make their own things. And one thing also is the way, I think Marvel and DC look, the, the way it's changed now, I feel like, because you guys have the means to make comics so much more readily than you did before between sort of, you know, the social access you have at cons and places like this to meet artists if you're a writer and meet writers if you're an artist at sites like DeviantArt or Pencil Jack or any of that stuff. And the fact that you can publish your own comics. DC and Marvel want to see you um, make your own comic in some way before they're going to take you on to do anything. So one of the great things too is you're already kind of forming your voice before you go there, I think, in some way, even if you end up wanting to use them or need them, you know, to then boost what you really want to do for yourself creatively, you know, in that way too. So, it, I think the most important thing if you're an aspiring writer out there is to, to work on the stories you would like to read for comics and make your own comics that you're, you're proud of and then decide if you want to use them as a springboard to do even more of that somehow, if you need, you know, in that way. But it sounds like uh, Marvel is looking for new artists
Isn't it bigger? I don't. I mean, on, on images, mm-hmm. more, like bigger selling point. Of, there's a, they do a lot of stuff that with with writers and creators that are really just getting their doing their first work. You know, so I mean, we just they're not as well known as as some of the bigger stuff. You know. I think the only hard thing is that it's there's a lot of books coming out. You know, in that way too. So if you're you're starting and you know, you look for what's going to make the most sense for you in terms of, you know, your your comfort level. I mean, an image, when there are a lot of books by a lot of well-known creators, sometimes I think you, it could, you know, crowd, it could get crowded and it might be harder for people that are just coming in. But they do throw a lot of support, I know, I mean, behind the books that, that are chooses, I mean, and, and new creators they're very supportive of. But I think there are a lot of ways, you know, whether you work at companies like Bloom or Dark Horse or stuff like that, too, that are becoming more and more open to doing creator own, even though they don't have the same kind of freedom with licensing or all that. There are places to go where you can start to own your voice, I think, too, you know. Image is so great for all of us, and I think a lot of us have the means to do books that then become commercially viable. You know, I, I could just do Witches and not Batman um, if I wanted at this point. Um, but when you're starting out, I think the most important thing is just get your work out there in a way that you can you can live on, or live live with, you know, in some way, where you're, you're showing people what your voice is. And that opens options for you. Um, but when the image was started in the 90s uh, by six people or seven people, whatever, in a way, I mean, Scott and I were talking about this on the airplane, um, we, we all owe them big time, obviously. Um, and it was very brave of them to do what they did, and they proved that creators don't really need big publishers all the time. Um, and so in many ways, we're still following in their footsteps. Obviously, we still even have the same logo, look at the same company. Um, but, you know, some would argue that they crashed it into the ground to some degree. And I'm wondering, we're the new stewards of this. What, are we going to hurt it? Like, what do we have to do to, to take care of it and to keep it going in a safer way? You guys ever think about that? <laughs> no hologram covers. No hologram covers. <laughs> yeah, I think we just need to use more, like, sustainables in this practices rather than relying on gimmicks and rather than relying on, um, you know, speculation and collectors. Instead, we should probably focus on building our readership, um, readers who are kind of in it for the long haul, uh, rather than just buying up first issues and variant covers, um, and continuing to expand into, like, different demographics. I still want a hologram cover now. Just one, just one, just me holographically, like, into my face, like this, just a hologram. We're also we're enormously grateful to you guys. I remember when I worked for Marvel in DC, sometimes I would get copies of a French version of one of my books, and I'd say, I had no idea this existed. And at Image, uh, it was all our decision to go to Urban. They said, you can go wherever you want. And that was an unheard of amount of control for creators. So um, we're grateful that we've gotten to choose how we reach an international audience and uh, and thank you for Urban too for being so excellent and uh, yeah so thank you guys. Alors moi j'avais une question pour uh, Sean Murphy justement par rapport à um, off road qui est euh, plutôt une histoire personnelle. Je voulais savoir combien le côté personnel, si c'était retrouvé un peu atténué euh, par rapport à enfin, après euh, l'édition. Um, so I did a book called Off Road in 2003. I wrote it, uh, and um, it's been published recently in, in France. And when uh, Francois was going to publish it, it was right after uh, the. Joe the Barbarian, Wake, and Punk Rock Jesus. And I asked him, like, can you please tell people that this book is very old? And I wrote it when I was kind of still a kid. And, but if you're looking for Punk Rock Jesus too, this is not that book. Um, but uh, to answer your question, um, we, we did uh, take a brand new Jeep off-road. I did go with my friend into risking it and going into the puddle. I mean, it is word for, almost uh, true to exactly what happened. Even there, there's a fire in the story started by these uh, rednecks. Um, it, it's an amazing amount of react- the fire truck, the way that we got the jeep out with the uh, construction equipment. Um, everything basically was true. The only subplot I added was this uh, 
because I was 23. This like artsy, artistic girl problems and this, you know, insecurity. And, you know, when I was writing the book, I thought, man, everyone at Oni or these smaller publishers always does like insecure artist who breaks up with a girl. And I'm like, well, at least mine has the Jeep in it, so <laughs> it's like blankets for men. <laughs> um, but yeah, everything was basically true. All the girl stuff, subplots, I was tacked together of things that different women did to me that wronged me. And, um, I've changed the names a little bit, and uh, one girl I hadn't spoken to for a while, I changed her name from Leone to Leona. And uh, someone in, she was in Switzerland, someone somehow a copy got to her, and she emailed me a picture of her. She's the villain in the book. She emailed me a picture of, like seeing what I had done, and I published her as a monster, but I changed her name, and she was not happy. <laughs> but, yeah, but I thought, you know, if you'd been a little bit nicer to me, then I wouldn't have to destroy you on, on paper. <laughs> so what goes around comes around. Okay, um, thank you very much, guys. Uh, thank you also for such a diversity in your stories. I think what you're doing, each one of you is helping to create a lot of uh, new books that attract new readers, and that the comic book industry right now is continuing to change uh, in a good way, and showing the world uh, that American comic books are not just superheroes but as much more diversity. And what you and that's because of you, so really thank you very much. Okay. Thanks for having me. Uh, to show you how strong it is, is even with current events happening in, in, in France and what you guys are going through, uh, it's still not enough to keep all of us coming here and meeting together and going through strict security just to enjoy each other's company. So thank you so much for making us feel welcome and safe. Juste un, un mot pour, pour, pour terminer, c'est que effectivement on est tous, je pense ici, des lecteurs ou euh, des lecteurs potentiels de comics. Mais pour moi, en tant, en tant qu'éditeur, ma volonté c'est vraiment de... Pour moi, le, le comics c'est un genre pluriel. On, on parle de comics, et, ça, historiquement, le comics est associé aux super-héros par, voilà, par la manière dont il nous est arrivé en premier. Mais il faut bien prendre conscience qu'aux états unis et également en France, c'est vraiment ce que nous, euh, chez Herbert, on tend à faire, c'est montrer vraiment toute cette diversité. C'est-à-dire que le super-héros est un genre... Le thriller en est un autre, on a le polar, la science-fiction, l'horreur, la chronique intimiste. Euh, il y a vraiment énormément de, euh, de genres à partager et ce qu'il ne faut pas oublier c'est qu'à la base, même si vous travaillez sur un personnage de, de licence ou sur un personnage qui vous appartient, on parle vraiment de création. Donc vraiment c'est ce qu'on essaie de promouvoir euh, depuis le début chez Urban, vraiment mettre l'auteur avant même parfois le, 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 le personnage sous licence euh, sur lequel il travaille. Donc c'est vraiment cette diversité, cette, cette promotion vraiment de la création et qui s'incarne aujourd'hui effectivement parfaitement sans entrave dans leur chaîne éditeur comme image. Et voilà, donc vive les comics euh, au pluriel. <rires>